new spoiler, I didn't get to the point that I thought I was going to be, but I do have cool demos, just not as cool as I thought they were going to be. Um, one other note, I make a joke in the, the, the subtitle. Um, I didn't actually reverse engineer the Apple II. There's tons of great books about it and like learning that the understanding the 2E is coming uh, as a reprint is really exciting to me because I would love to have a paper copy. I was just trying to make a Dr. Strangelove joke. So I'm positive I'm going to run out of time. And so I need to give thank you to a number of people. I've actually been live streaming this project for almost two years. Uh, the archive is well over 400 hours at this point. And there are a ton of people who have helped me. Most of the people here, our names listed here, are people that I think might be watching or eventually see this. They hang out in the chat. They, uh, they help me with a lot of things. And uh, they're usually my rubber ducks. So I just wanted to make sure I said thank you to them at the beginning so that I can rush through the uh, self-promotion at the end. So uh, about six years ago, I got an Apple II GS because I wanted to learn more about the Apple II. Uh, I'm a very much a hardware guy. Uh, I've been, at the time, I was repairing a lot of um, another 6502 based computer. Uh, you guys might not have ever heard of it, something like Commodore or something like that. Um, and I had vague memories of the Apple II as a kid because it was in my classrooms and I remembered the 2GS. And so when I decided to learn more about the Apple II, I got a 2GS for obvious reasons. Turns out I couldn't remember how to boot, reset. I didn't know what PR pound six was, so I needed to learn. And I started with the hardware technical reference, which is where I found the chapter on the Mega 2 IC. And I loved the sentence that said, except for the central processor and memory, the Mega 2 incorporates logic circuitry for all the major functions of the Apple IIe on a single chip. And I immediately thought two things. One, oh, that's how the 2GS is backward compatible. And two, I wonder if you can take it out and make an Apple IIe. So, spoiler, number one is false, and number two is true. Now, at the beginning, I was naive and thought it was going to be as simple as desolder the chip from the board, put it into a breakout, hook up RAM, ROM, and a 6502, just like the previous page said, and we'd boot into a computer. Well, I didn't know what I didn't know, which turns out a whole lot. Uh, now, technically, one minor note, I did in that step, in the very first step, I was able to actually write assembly code and fetch stuff and the mega decoded addresses correctly. So technically it did do exactly what I thought it would, except I thought I was going to get to an Apple prompt with just like four parts connected to it. And that's not at all the case. So let me walk you around the mega really quick before I show you some of the things that I learned about it. So starting off, there's address lines for the CPU or 6502 side. There's address lines for the uh, DRAM side, just like a 2E. There's a main data bus and an aux data bus, and if you know anything about the Apple II architecture, then you already know what those are. The first set of signals that are unique to the Mega 2 is what I call the S bus, and these connect to a chip called Slot Maker. Slot Maker is what allows you to select between internal and external devices. It buffers the clock, and it has a couple of other functions, curiously, which we'll talk about later. And then we get to RGB 8421, which is a parallel or word tokenized version of Servid. And Servid is the same thing as SirOut on the 2C and the 2E, even though it doesn't actually come to a pin on the 2E. You might notice, well, I already said what it was, but I just want to point out, it's called RGB, but it's 8421, and uh, RGB is 3. I'm not a mathematician, but I know that those aren't the same. But basically, it turns out it's a 4-bit value that is the color of the screen on the Apple II. It, and I'll explain why that was actually really awesome later. There's some memory signals, which nothing special. There's clocks. The one comment I'll make about the clock, the Mega takes in a 14 meg clock, and then it generates the seven, uh, I always want to say it's the three, the Q3, which is two, CREF and the phase clock, which is interesting because it gets the 14 meg clock from the two GSs, uh, VGC, which gets it from a 28 meg clock, which is why I often say, even though the Mega 2 isn't responsible for backward compatibility. If you take it out of a 2GS, it will not boot. Then we get into some signals that are kind of mixed in terms of 2E and Mega. The first one is MSW. This appears to be some kind of manufacturing test. I haven't actually figured out what it does yet. When I do, I'll write it up. And then I talked about Servid. Uh, next would be M2 Select or Mega Select or Mega Enable. This actually disables the decode logic of the Mega 2 which I find super interesting for a part that was originally intended to go into its own computer. 
it makes me think that somewhere between the 2C and the 2GS, the design of the Mega 2 had to change because I can't figure out why you would have this in anything other than the 2GS. The CYA or FPI, depending on which board you have, disables the Mega anytime address decoding happens, which is why I say this doesn't actually have anything to do with emulation on the 2GS. The only thing the Mega does is the video modes. Everything else is either in the CYA or the 2GS's ROM. The other clue is that um, ROM enable, which I call ROMin and then I call phase zero fo and everybody on my chat gets hungry. <sighs> ROMin, ROM enable is not connected to anything on the 2GS. Window is unique to the uh, Mega 2 and I'll explain what it does in a little bit. It's a video related signal. And then we have X and Y, which is for the 2E mouse that I've done nothing with yet. Uh, paddle trigger is probably something to do with, I don't know, hand paddles. Uh, speaker, I learned yesterday, is going to do a whole lot more cool stuff now that I know about all the things we can do with sound. And then case select one and two um, stand for keyboard uh, select, I believe. I found it interesting that there's two of those signals. Now, in the first revision, I made three separate boards. One with the Mega and the RAM, and then on the bottom is a 65, 65C02 with the RAM. Let me try that again. The 65C02 with the ROM, so those two were connected together, and then the Mega board connected to a video board. The video board is a direct copy of the 2GS's video circuit. In my grand scheme, I had planned to make HDMI out a requirement of this project. At this stage, I just wanted to know, could the Mega boot? So I decided not to mess with anything related to video and just copy this circuit. It captures the RGB 8421 signals from the Mega and then converts it, the VGC converts it into a binary value. And then there's a DAC and a traditional analog circuit that creates composite video. So for about the first year, everything I did was with composite video. So this, eventually we got this pile of wires to boot to something that looked like this. And there's two takeaways. First is, it was after this point I realized I was supposed to be using the enhanced 2E ROM, not the unenhanced. And the way I finally figured it out is Merlin's uh, character set is messed up with the wrong ROM. But this was the unenhanced, didn't have anything to do with this, this problem at boot. If you think back to the set of boards I just showed you, there was a key thing missing and I sort of forgot in terms of 8-bit computers, it's a super key thing because they sit on the data bus and that's the keyboard. There's nothing driving the keyboard when the ROM goes and hits C1000 or C010, the two soft switches that deals with the keyboard. So eventually it crashes. Well, not actually even eventually, it's pretty much right away. So how am I gonna handle the keyboard? Now, I have no, disregard, uh, no disrespect to retro computer projects that use PS2 keyboards, but I'm sick and tired of using my one PS2 keyboard on all these projects. I want it USB. I said USB, USB, USB. So how are we going to get from USB to basically the 8-bit Apple bus? While those boards were getting manufactured, I spent some time uh, looking at the Apple IIe, because by that point I realized the Mega had very little to do with the 2GS. It was, it's an Apple IIe. So I thought, maybe I should learn how this circuit works. So basically you've got a microcontroller that scans the matrix, it addresses a ROM, and then the memory controller, or MMU, will use a signal to enable that ROM whenever you hit C1000. It outputs whatever the address value is onto the data bus. There's some magic that the IOU does to, one, determine when C010 happens, and track whether it has to clear the high bit or not. But the takeaway is there's two key signals, KBD and, I probably should do that since people can't see, uh, KBD and key ready. Hmm, the Mega had two signals. So, oh, first, uh, just to set something up. So I had to find something that could, could uh, respond to that KBD signal. This is a logic analyzer trace in the uh, orange box is the enable signal, and it's enabled for roughly 400 nanoseconds. Initially, I thought I could just use a microcontroller and an interrupt, and then in the interrupt, I could output the value. Problem is, most microcontrollers can take on the order of microseconds. Um, and so I needed something that could respond fast enough that we could respond to the fact that there's an interrupt, put out the correct value, and then get back off the bus. So I settled on a Pi Pico. This is the microcontroller board that's kind of like Arduino-like from Raspberry Pi. On it is an RP2040. So why would I pick this microcontroller out of all the possible options? 
Uh, first is they only cost a dollar for the chip, four dollars for the board. The second is that it can be a host for USB HID. Third is they're available, unlike <clears throat> every CPLD and FPGA out there. And the fourth is, and this was the real, real reason, they have something called the PIO, not platform IO, but programmable IO. So inside of this chip are two ARM Cortex M0 pluses, which is fantastic, great cores, blah, blah, blah. What I care about is they also have a thing called the PIO modules that can control the GPIOs. You can use the GPIOs like you would on a regular microcontroller, but the PIO is an independent state machine that runs completely separate from the processor. And it can respond within tens of nanoseconds to actions on its pins. So it's basically, you get 32 instructions, you've got a memory of 32 instructions out of a nine instruction set that is basically meant to be a way to do uh, protocol communication. And so we bastardized it to simulate or uh, to replicate the behavior of the IOU dealing with C010. Now, this code is actually from later in the project. I didn't have what the code was at this stage. I just wanted to show you that this is kind of what the PIO code looks like. It's a bunch of assembly-like instructions. It's really fun. By the way, if you want to get into like assembly and C-level coding, the RP2040 or Pico is a fantastic platform for it. It's like best of both worlds. Modern 32-bit stuff, um, uh, assembly programming with like virtually no memory. So I just wanted to show this real quick. So over on the C side, on the Cortex core, we have a function that writes to a FIFO and then the PIO gets that value from the FIFO. That's the key press that we want to process. The PIO handles arbitrating everything on the Apple II bus. The really awesome thing is uh, it responds with, to uh, output enable or keyboard in less than 60 nanoseconds, which is twice as fast as the original ROM. Now, coming back to this, the K, um, Mega had two keyboard signals. The 2E had two keyboard signals. So I, being the fantastic engineer that I'm not, I thought these must be the same. Hint, they're not. However, they worked close enough that I could get the Pico to drive the data bus during the, data, uh, the keyboard access and get to a stable prompt. The problem is I couldn't type anything. Either I got ignored, we would crash, it would repeat, it wasn't working. And after some analysis with the logic analyzer, oh, actually, first, Okay, after some analysis with the logic analyzer, I started thinking about this. I'm like, wait a minute. This, this kind of, really, it scratched my brain. Everything else on this chip is zero-based. Why did they start with one on case select? Hint, they did not. Turns out, for completely obvious reasons, which I'm sure I don't need to explain to any of you, the missing keyboard signal comes from the slot maker chip. I, I have not figured this one out. So to connect to Mega, you have to connect over this six bit bus. I call it a bus, but I actually think they're like all enable signals, but let's call it a bus uh, in order to get case select. And then once you have that, then you have the three bit case select bus. So you know when C0, C01, and whether nothing is happening. The problem is at this stage in the project, I was going to, I had to now remove a slot maker connect it with those six wires, plus it also needs all of the clocks, which it buffers for the, the I, well, it buffers it for the slots, but I didn't know if it needed it for anything else. Power, blah, blah, blah. And at this stage, now this is what Rev1 looked like. Um, this boots, this worked, and this was, this was like the three boards, the Pico, and then my two logic analyzers all plugged in so I could see what the hell was going on. But every time I made a change, it was like five to 10 minutes of trying to figure out which wire I lost. So it was time for a new approach. In Rev2, I went a slightly different direction. Um, I decided at this point, I knew the Mega2 could boot, and now it's gonna be a matter of how can we figure out all the Apple IIe functions with that chip. So I designed it as a backplane system, and then on the backplane, there is um, one connector that has all the address and data lines, one that has the clocks, and then one that has all the control signals, plus a couple others I thought would be interesting, like case select. On the right, you can see I designed a uh, plug-in board, or a new controller board, which was the Mega RAM, ROM, and CPU. And then what plugs into the right of that is the video board, which early on was still the uh, composite video board, the only thing that survived from revision one. To plug into the slots, so to speak, 
were a keyboard board up in the, our keyboard interface up in the upper left, which was based on the RP2040. On the right was the slot maker board. And then on the bottom, an example of an IWM board. So my, my 2E computer will have an IWM because they're kind of useless without it, right? I mean, I'm not, it's not 1980. I'm not typing everything into basic every time I want to do something. Now, the one part that I think was the most clever, like I, I feel like I've done a lot of things, but I think this was the most clever thing I thought of, is on that back plane, I laid out the connector for the address and data bus so that my digital, digital discovery could plug directly into it. No more flywires significantly made debugging easier. This was, like I said, I think of all the cool things that we've done in this project, that's probably the one that I'm like, hey, that's, that's the coolest thing. And it took zero effort, right? Okay, so I don't actually have a ton to talk about on Rev2 because it sort of came up just with your typical hardware debug stuff. Except for every once in a while, we would get these random crashes and they were repeatable, but they weren't always happening, but they were pretty consistent. So for example, if Bitsy Buy was loading, it might crash during ProDOS, but it would always crash when it would try to uh, access slot three. Uh, AppleWorks would crash right before it asked you for the date. Frogger was the one that was the most repeatable because when you hit D to define keys, that's when it would crash. And so it gave me a place to trigger on the logic analyzer to try to understand what's going on. So I'm searching through the ROM. So the address line is the top orange, bottom orange is case select. I'm searching through the ROM trying to figure out what's happening around this time. My thought was we're hitting a C switch the Mega doesn't know about and everything freaks out. Or soft switch, I call them C switches, I know they're soft switches. And then I just happened to notice that case select was kind of toggling around when it shouldn't be. I thought that was interesting. At first, I thought it was because the digital, or the digital discovery is a th really meant for 3.3 volts, so its threshold is like one something. And so any noise in a five volt system shows up. Looked at it on a scope, it was very clear for one clock cycle of phase zero, we were getting a glitch on one of the lines of case select. What was frustrating about that is it was happening at addresses that were not C000 or C010. This is the bug I talk about because I don't think the Mega is supposed to do this. I think this is supposed to be a gated output because it doesn't always happen. And it's something about once we start talking to the disk drive, this starts happening. And so I'm not sure what's happening in the logic that allows for this. Now on the 2GS, there's a keyboard glue chip that actually qualifies K-Select with the clock signal. I didn't do that in my PIO. One drawback of the PIO is it's not state-based. It's pretty much asynchronous. And so if you want to detect when something goes from zero to one, you have to wait for it to be zero, go to one, and then have a jump condition to go back. And at this stage in the project, I have a 32 instruction memory and I have 32 instructions in it. So I don't have an option to really do a software thing. But I put on my Waz hat and said, you know what? I've already got a buffer chip that does the uh, voltage translation anyway. Let's just turn that into a latch. So now, so on revision three of the Rev2 keyboard interface, uh, I put in a latch, it data qualified the signals, fixed the problem. I could have probably fixed it in software, especially with uh, help of my friend that uh, cleaned up some of this, but it was like, we'll just put a lat, we, I mean, we already have to have the chip anyway, so we'll just make the chip more useful. The only problem I really had at this point in Rev2 is that we were still using the analog uh, controller board and I really wanted HDMI. I, I was planning to use the HDMI controller or uh, transceiver from the open source scan converter project. And after a couple of days of working with it, I decided I didn't want to spend a lot of time figuring out another chip that I don't have a data sheet for. And yes, I know you can download a data sheet for the ITE663, but it's not the programmer's data sheet. It's basically like the electrical data sheet. There's nothing in there about what the registers are. So I decided we would go with VGA instead. The reason why is because we found a library for the Pi Pico, and I figured, hey, this way we can use a known working software library, a interface that's relatively available today, and then we can focus on how do we get that uh, video data from the Mega 2. So remember I mentioned the window signal? This window signal actually hints to the VGC when the border can be drawn, which I find super interesting that the Mega tells the VGC when that time frame is. I don't quite understand why the VGC doesn't do it, but 
I don't care because, but did I, no, I didn't. So window is inactive during vertical blank, which makes it super easy to detect because I just wait for it to be inactive for like a millisecond and I know we're blanking. Normally you would look at sync and sync does this weird inversion thing and I didn't want to figure out the code to, to do that or build a circuit for it. So we got our vertical blanking information from the window signal. Remember I said RGB is a four bit value. So it's not obvious on here and I don't have a really good example, but Servid, when Servid comes out, there's four bits of Servid and then four of those four bits, RGB uh, 842 is a certain four bit value. That's the color that Servid represents. And I did find a table somewhere and I need to go back in my notes and find out where, but basically what I learned is if I clock in the RGB values on the 14 megahertz clock, I get one pixel uh, for each clock. The really cool thing is it doesn't matter what video mode the Apple II is in. My video hardware doesn't care because it gets the same number of pixels every single time, which I also find interesting about how the Mega 2 does it because uh, there's no graphic signal. There's, there's actually nothing coming out of the Mega 2 to tell me what mode it's in. All I get is this, this bit stream that never changes. Oh, almost never changes. Now, what we ended up doing is RGB window and 14 meg goes into one core of a PI, oh, one PIO and gets processed by one core of another RP2040, shared through a frame, frame buffer into another core or the second core running the Pico VGA library. And then that outputs the signals that turn into VGA. Just for reference, that's what the board ends up looking like. Um, you can see the RP2040 is uh, blurry and in the back. Uh, okay. Let me show you what I'm doing. Now, this is pretty much the setup that I have on the table up here. The only differences are I'm not using this keyboard. I don't have a floppy drive. Instead, I'm using a floppy MU and I'm not using a VGA monitor. So actually, this is almost nothing like what I have up here. <laughs> um, but the mega hardware is the same. It's literally the same same uh, Rev2 hardware. Uh, I've got the, the controller board, slot maker, my keyboard interface, and IWM. And so what I'm going to do, and then I'm connected to the VGA board through VGA capture. Okay, cool. Um, and I have a feeling if I try to make this full screen, it's going to mess up. So I'm just going to leave it the way it is. And then um, let me make sure my keyboard's on. All right, turn it on. One, two, three, four, five. <laughs> this time the beep didn't work. <laughs> that is hilarious. I have no idea. Okay. It, I know what it is, but I can't fix it. I'm not, I'm, I'll break something if I try to do it. Um, okay, so Alien Downpour Boots, uh, just to show you. So I'm using a wireless USB keyboard. And then, yeah, 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 yeah. Now, I'm going to do really poorly because there's about a 500 millisecond delay through the capture hardware, and that's totally why I'm not good at this game. Okay. Let's do demo number two, which is going to be harder because of the screen, but we'll make it work. Uh... All right. So uh, since I'm using a modern keyboard, we don't have the reset key that you find in um, you know, the Apple IIe. So anyone guess what I did instead? You know, control, delete. So this time I'm going to load AppWorks. Uh, I'm only going, well, yeah, we'll just get to the, the title screen uh, just because I want to show that it's actually loading in 80 column mode. Like I said, I'm, I'm nervous about trying to make that bigger because I'm having, uh, it seems like it messes up with my video. But that's my basic demo. So games work fine. AppWorks works fine. I'm very happy with the way that Rev2 works. I don't like the way it looks, but I'm happy with the way it works. Nope. 
Okay, so revision three. Wait, I was gonna make a joke, but I'll wait till after we're done recording. So for revision three, what I wanted to do was combine everything into a single board. That was my original plan. Uh, with each of these revisions, the goal was to learn something more about the design so that I could get to this final design. And so I literally just took all of the blocks of the prototype boards that I built, and I haven't even shown, I've only shown half of what we built for this, and um, combine them into a schematic. And uh, on Saturday of last weekend, it looked like this. So it's got, it's got the Mega, a slot maker, an IWM. Uh, I didn't populate the DB19 yet just because I have a small number of them, so I wanna make sure everything else is working before I waste it. I didn't put the game port on it yet because my joystick doesn't work anyway, so. I did add the green LEDs that you see near the bottom of the screen. There's two sets. One is the upper eight bits of the address bus, and then the bottom are the enunciator pins. Um, and then over on the right, you see there's a, a, a sad face. Turns out somebody who will rename nameless wired the EEPROM to always be disabled. Don't know why I did that, he did that, but. <laughs> so I tried to bodge it, and then my EEPROM programmer stopped programming the EEPROMs for some reason, and I haven't figured out what's going on with that. Uh, out of 50 attempts, it, it programmed the EEPROM twice, and I have, now I have 15, and I kept cycling through them, and it just, some, just fails, and I have no idea why, and one time it'll work. It reads them fine, but it won't write them. And then I did another bodge and another bodge and another bodge, and then I got to a point where uh, I had to get in the car and come here. And so I think we're really close. The good news is this board, it's acting like it should if the ROM isn't there. So like if I put a blank ROM into the Rev2, it works just like the Rev2 works. So I suspect most things are working. It's just that it, I can't, I, I don't know how to give it a brain yet, so. So what's next? Um, this is actually the first 3D print I did to see what it would look like and get an idea of it. There's probably been four or five iterations of it, but it is this size. So that's the size I'm going for. This Rev3 board will fit inside of it. My, my target was to make it fit on top of a five and a, uh, five and a quarter inch floppy drive, but it's slightly bigger. So first thing I gotta do is get the EEPROM working, then I need to finish uh, this case, uh, and then I've got to make a video for Element 14 Presents. So I did a video on the first part of this uh, earlier this year, now I'm gonna do one on this version of it. Got some more EEPROM stuff, or uh, RP2040 stuff to work on. Uh, the one thing I do plan to do is take all of the notes I have and create a faux data sheet for the Mega 2, because that's the one thing I wish I had throughout this entire project. It would have made things so much easier if I knew what most of the pins did. Uh, so that was, that's always been in my plan is to take all my notes. And in fact, even in doing this presentation, I had to go and refer to stuff because I've already forgotten what stuff does. Like it just, because I, I didn't care about some of it. And then some other things. Oh yeah, actually because of yesterday's FujiNet demo, um, I am going to try to get SmartPort working. It was not working the last time I tried to uh, shoehorn it into the ROM, but now I have a motivation to really get it to work, so. Uh, one, one thing to let you guys know about, if you need 8-bit vintage, or well, just vintage computer schematics, I do have a repo, repo on GitHub called BitPreserve. Um, in fact, all the schematics you saw except for the Rev, well, may, actually I didn't show them. So there are, there are schematics for most of the Apple II computers. The person that did the 2GS schematic hasn't finished it yet, but the others seem to be done. If there's one, my quick comment on this is, if you've ever wanted to use KiCad and wanted to understand how to use it, don't know how to use it, re, basically grab a PDF of a schematic, redraw it, submit it. It's a great way to learn how to use KiCad. Um, like I mentioned, I live streamed this, so if you wanna see it, Fridays, Friday mornings, Sunday nights, I'll be working on it for a couple more weeks. With that, thank you. Thank you, that's fantastic. Do we have any questions from Rockhurst? Hi, I'm Ron, long time listener, first time caller. 
Um, I wanted to ask you about, because I've been following your project for quite a while now. Um, I know that the Gemini 2, that you had mm -hmm. kind of looked into that for a while. Um, I guess the speculation was, is that was sort of like a, a bug fixed version of Mega 2 or something along those lines, because that was what was ended up being integrated into the uh, Apple IIe option card for the right. Macintosh. Would you maybe, um, if there's anything really to say um, about other than just scarcity on that other part, why the Mega 2 was the focus instead of maybe looking at some of that other stuff? <laughs> that is a great question. It was Ron? Yes, sir. Yeah, thanks. That, that's a great question because I have an excellent reason for it uh, or answer to that. At least I think it's excellent. Uh, the Gemini, okay, so in the Apple IIe expansion card that goes into the LC Max, the, the chip on that is called Gemini. And if you look around Gemini, you'll see an IWM, a, a 65 CO2, um, a PROM, which is actually, I think, for the Mac. Uh, the ROM for that chip actually comes over the bus, I believe. Um, and, oh, and there's also a 558 for the game port. And then in the middle is Gemini. So from everything I can tell, Gemini is a follow-on to the Mega 2. And the primary reason I decided not to focus on the Gemini is because it already works, right? There's already a card that you can use today and boot Oregon Trail or whatever you want. Um, the goal of this project was to determine, did the Mega 2 actually work? Because the, the 2GS doesn't use most of its functionality. And until I did my Element 14 video, I didn't know that the Tiger Learning Computer existed, which was a market test product. So technically, that's probably the, only, the first standalone computer to use it that we know of, but does anyone have one, right? And it didn't run Apple IIe software. And so I didn't doubt that the Mega 2 didn't work, but it occurred to me, why did they call that chip Gemini? Why wasn't that chip called Mega, if it's just a Mega? Um, by the way, I didn't get into it, but on actually on Tuesday, right before I drove down here, uh, I found out that there's actually two versions of the Mega 2 chip, and they don't work identical. Uh, the video signals are slightly different, and I don't know why yet. And so, early on in the project, my suspicion was, what if the Mega 2 never worked? What if that was the reason it ended up in the 2GS? Or, when it was decided to cancel whatever the, the follow-on to the 2E was going to be, what if, what if they never finished it? So, so that's why. Yeah. Thanks. Any other questions from Rockcrest before we turn it over to the online folks? Okay, Andy, what questions are coming in online? Okay, we have two questions. Uh, first one from Brian K. Is this Mega Apple II like an Apple IIe reloaded board with mods? So, um, it, okay, it's, it's similar in concept to like a reloaded board, but I have no intention to productize this. Um, in order to build this board, you have to take chips out of a 2GS. There's no other source for the Mega 2 or the slot maker. Um, you could get away with not having the IWM, but I don't think from a practical perspective, this makes much sense. Um, unless you have a 2GS with a, with a battery bomb board, then why would, you, why would you put this into something else? Um, that doesn't preclude an idea for a follow-on project where we could do something like that, but I don't intend for that to be this case. Um, my goal was to do this project to see if the Mega 2 would work and uh, kind of leave it at that. So my hope was that other people wouldn't have to destroy computers to find out what I found out. And so far, if I put the chips back, my two GSs still work, so. Great, okay, question number two, again from Brian K. Do you have a GitHub page for this project? And if so, could you post it in Discord? Uh, it's already posted in Discord, um, and it was the QR codes. But yeah, there's, if you scroll to the top of the Discord, it's, it's listed there. And it's, for the most part, up to date. But yeah, it's, I, I, I don't know if, yeah, it, it should be up to date. Great, okay. that's it for online questions. Thank Excellent. you. Thank you.